Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our Purple Aster project. Ooh, I'm super excited for this project um, and it's pretty straightforward. It's just five steps. So our very first step is we are going to put in the yellow dots which will turn into the centers of our flowers. Our second step is we will put in the petals on all of our yellow dots or our aster. Our third step is we will put in a medium value on our centers. Our fourth step is we will put in a medium and dark value on our petals. And our last step is doing one final layer on our centers, which will be the darkest value, which is gonna make it pop and create that form that we're kind of looking for. I have Michael here working the cameras. He's my husband. Hello. And uh, he was a biology major, so he knows all the fun things about flowers, which is great. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> and then I'm using two paintbrushes for this project. Our first one is around six, and then the other one is our quarter inch dagger, which is the special bonus item for our Language of Flowers box. So if you purchase this box, you should have this brush. If you don't have this brush, you should get this brush because it is so good. I love it. Um, we are using four paint colors for this project. I'm just gonna erase this one because we're not using that one. Our first color is berry blue. Our second color is tiger orange. Our third color is magenta, and our very last color is violet. We're using our in-house paint brand, which is a liquid watercolor, vibrant, fun. They aren't light fast, so just know that if you put them in direct sunlight, they will fade over time. That's actually true for many paints. I mean, sun is the enemy of paint, so. Sun is the enemy of uh, preserving anything. Yeah, so just be aware. But it's great for practice, it's great for playing, and it's great for learning, so I'm really excited. Um, I think we can uh, do our oath and jump in. Let's do it. All right. If you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. I promise to have fun. Thank you. I love starting that way. And if you didn't know, the whole theme of this box is Language of Flowers. And it started because I illustrated a book, it's right here, let me show you, um, called Language of Flowers. It just came out. And it was probably one of my favorite books I've ever illustrated because it's just paintings of flowers and um, their meanings. And I realized as I was painting this that I fell in love with some flowers and I really wanted to do a whole month dedicated to painting flowers and how lovely they are and the differences that you can approach flowers and the tools that I use to paint them and all of that fun stuff. So this project is Aster, which was one of my favorite projects that I did for this book. And Aster says it is it symbolizes wisdom, valor, and elegance. It's named after the Greek word for star. This bloom symbolizes wisdom and courage. In ancient times, asters were laid on the graves of French soldiers who had died in battle. Today, the star-like flowers are a symbol of love and elegance. Love it. Beautiful, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so we're ready to go. Let's do it. So I'm gonna use my round six. Get it wet, hit it off the side of the cup so it's not dripping. Very rarely do you want dripping paintbrush going to your paper. And I'm gonna grab some tiger orange, mix a little bit of water in there so it becomes more like a light value yellow. And there's no outline with this project, we're just going to put in dots, okay? Which are going to act as the center of our flowers. If you kinda wanna go off the reference photo, you are welcome to, or you can just like, Go for it. There's no wrong here. I will say that one thing that I wanted to do when painting this is I wanted to try and not have it be perfectly staggered where they looked like they were lined up. I wanted it to feel like there was like a heaviness through the middle. Um, you see that, how I made it more dense in the middle and then a little bit more sparse on the sides. So that's the kind of feeling I was going for, um, but you guys can shift and do whatever you want because this is your painting and it's okay if some of the yellows are closer together than others i just want to acknowledge that we still have to put petals on here 
Um, so if you have two that are like right next to each other, that might be a little tricky, but don't shy away from having them sometimes overlap. And also know that you can totally add more flowers whenever you want. We're kind of just laying down the groundwork and then as we add petals, as we do more of the stuff, we'll realize, oh, this is a very bare area, all of that stuff. You'll also notice that I changed up the size of my dots. Some are a little bit larger, some are a little bit smaller. Um, that's because I like variation in sizes. That's true to what we would see in nature. So switch up the size of your dots. Okay, that's step one. Good job. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Now we're gonna move on to step two and I'm gonna switch my dagger brush and we're gonna start putting in the um, petals on our centers. Now, when you are painting your petals, I've noticed that depending on the type of flower that you're trying to paint, you really do wanna pay attention to the ratio of size between the petal, the size of the petals and the size of the center. Um, sometimes that gives that viewer information and is an identifying factor in what the flower is. I've noticed that when I make the um, petals way longer than the center, it looks more like daisies as opposed to um, aster. So when you add your petals, you want your petals to roughly be the same length as the center of your flower. I mean, as this, yeah, as the center. So if I'm like, I mean, it's tricky to do with little fingers, but if you, you can just eyeball it where you're just like, okay, this is the length of the center. So then when I add my petals, that's about as far out as I want to go. Okay, and so just like roughly eyeball it for the rest of them. I don't know if y'all have watched the um, How Does Your Garden Grow tutorials yet, specifically the strawberry one, but when, a, when an aster is pollinated and it goes to seed, mm -hmm. it's also an akeen. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a non-edible akeen, but it's an akeen. Interesting. Yeah, and they're in the sunflower family. Beautiful. That's why I like their center so much. Okay, so I took a little bit of violet and I took a little bit of berry blue. I put it in the middle and that's just because I'm trying to tone down some of that purple, but asters come in different colors too and slightly different hues. So have fun with it. There's no right or wrong here. And I'm gonna add water because I want this first layer to be kind of more like a light or a medium value. Okay, and then if you guys recall on our, let me get a scrap paper here. When I did a video showing you how to do the dagger, you can do the petals just with this brush. You kind of just press down and then lift at the end. Or if you want them a little bit more even in length, then you just wouldn't press down at as hard at the tip, if that makes sense. I've noticed that with these, the tip is slightly, the edge of the petal is a little bit thicker than the um, where it meets the middle, the center, but it stays actually, it's pretty even in width through the whole thing. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable doing the single stroke, see, that's pretty good, I like that. So how I'm doing that stroke is I'm doing the longer side closest to my paper. And I'm just whoosh, 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 okay? Um, you can always draw it too if you want and then fill it in, but with this brush that would take a really long time. So just do whatever works for you, okay? You are also welcome to use a different brush. And we're just gonna go. So roughly the same length. The other tricky thing is trying to get the angles of the flower, of the petals to kind of all face towards the center. So some, something that helps me sometimes is I'll look of it, think of it as like, okay, I'll do the top and then I'll go across and then I'll do it the other way like that. And then I'll just keep you see what I, like, it's like trying to draw. It's like cutting a pizza. Yeah, cutting a pizza or a pie is sometimes helpful. Or you can just go in a circle, but just know that when you go in a circle, it's really easy for your angles to start going like wonky. 
maybe you could do it like a clock, like do top bottom, and then nine o'clock and three o'clock, mm -hmm. and then just fill in between those. It would kind of keep them. Straight. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Whatever, whatever you need to do. And if you don't have your paper taped down, then you could just rotate your paper. So here we go. These two, my petals are gonna run into each other. That's okay. You can just overlap them or just leave kind of like a gap. And you might be looking at these and saying, Sarah, some petals are much thicker than others. Yeah, that is true to kind of what we would see too. You know, those petals are actually individual flowers. The head of an aster has like 300 flowers on it. The center has like 250 little flowers. And then the purple petals are modified, modified flowers called ray flores. So the head of an aster flower is 300 flowers. Does that make sense? What? Yeah, each little hair in the middle of the aster flower is a whole flower with male and female reproductive parts. So does that mean that like if a petal falls off, it could turn into its own flower? Or what does that actually mean? Like when you clone a plant, when you clone, you know, your friend gives you a cutting of something, right? Mm -hmm. It's a special part of a plant that has something called a node. Flowers don't have nodes. You can't cut a flower and stick it in a thing of water and grow a new plant from it. It has okay. to do with a bunch of hormones and very complicated things. But no, no, it couldn't. But it is its own flower. Okay, okay, cool. So when a, when a whole head of aster is pollinated and goes to seed and turns into that akeen that we were talking about, yeah, it actually produces a ton of different genetic material. If you were one flower that got pollinated, you would put out one child, right? Uh -huh. If you were a group of 300 that got pollinated, you would put out 300 different biological children, so there's a much higher chance of survival. Oh, okay, okay. Interesting. These are, I, it's so funny, until I read the description, I didn't really, the star, star-like flower, it didn't like cross my mind, and then as soon as it said that, I was like, oh yeah, these yeah. are like little stars. These are everywhere here in like the fall. Yes. They're beautiful. I also want to say that as I'm adding petals, I'm okay with there being some gaps. I'm okay, it doesn't have to feel super full because I am gonna go back later and add more petals. So like, we're just kind of doing that initial layer and I don't want you guys to stress out because at this point, as we're adding this, it's not supposed to look like this because our centers are very, very flat and that actually informs this painting and flower way more than anything else. So because we're just painting around an even soft yellow, it's gonna look not nice. <laughs> so just stick with it. Okay, we'll get there. And if you're right-handed, try and paint the left-hand side first so you don't smear your painting. See like this, this petal right here is totally off angle because it's coming out. It's the petal, if you were to like continue the petal line, it should go right through the center of your flower. So that's how you can check the angle, is if I were to continue this, does it hit that middle? And if it doesn't, because there are some petals that you're gonna do like I just did, where it like totally would not, that's okay, just keep going around. There are wonky petals. <laughs> Maybe that one got bent. This is getting into nerd territory, but I'm pretty sure the ray florets, the purple flowers that make the petals, mm -hmm. I don't think that they can be pollinated. I think they're like, they give up their ability to have babies to attract bees. Oh. But that's sweet. Hopefully, there's a biologist in the comments telling me otherwise. <laughs> Also, I want to acknowledge that you can, like, I just mix some more colors. I'm gonna, I went for a slightly more blue in this mixture this time, because I want to throw in like slightly different variations of hues and colors and values. Um, but it's up to you. Don't feel like if you didn't mix enough that it has to match perfectly. And 
And so this is a thicker center, so I'm gonna go a little bit longer. Ooh, that one got a little bit of a jacket edge. I can just round that off. Okay. This sounds crazy, maybe, but I feel like this kind of painting, it's like a morning painting. Like you should have like a nice warm cup of coffee, mm. just like silent after your kids have gone to school and the house is quiet. This is definitely one of those paintings that's repetitive brush strokes. Yeah. So it's very meditative. Yeah, you can like wake up and think about it. Yeah, because you don't have to like, I'm on autopilot right now. I'm not even... I'm trying not to talk that much. Um, and I'm just kind of like in it, painting. I will say that this is probably the longest step out of all of them. look look like a bunch of stars it's like the more I focus on it the more it just starts to look like a shot of the night sky you know what I mm -hmm. mean And I want to call attention to the fact that some of these petals are going to be skinnier than others. And that's because petals themselves, while they usually grow out flat, sometimes they kind of curve to the side a little bit. So sometimes we see the petals face on and sometimes they're doing this, which is going to make them much thinner. So I don't want you guys to, um, how do I say this? exactness and like carbon copies of everything is actually the like the enemy of a painting because when everything is exactly the same the same length the same color the same value your painting tends to be a little bit flat and it, our brain goes Oh, okay, I know what that is, and then moves on. There's not a lot for your brain to stay and look at. And so that's why we try and mix up petal shapes, values, hues, contrast, um, line, direction, all of those things, because it makes it more visually interesting. But it's hard, though, because when we start something, we think, I've seen flowers. Flowers are perfect little petals always. And if I have a wonky petal, then I'm not painting the flower correctly. I'm not doing it justice, all of those things. But that's just like in our mind, it's not reality. Reality is a flower. We see it at different angles. It goes through life just like we do, which means sometimes there are bumps and bruises, there's discoloration. And what's even funnier about that is that when we're out in nature, when we see something that has variation, um, like a huge, a huge sunflower or a tree that has really weird branches, we love it. We celebrate it, we think it's so special and unique. And then when we go to paint, those wonkiness aspects we uh, we like are hard on ourselves for and we think that they're not true, but I don't know. 
different standards, I guess, that we have. I, I think in, in my head when I'm being that kind of critical on myself, it's because I want my viewer to know what I'm painting. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, if I do a wonky little petal, they want to even understand that this is a flower. And so you want to make sure that they're all... You know, whatever. But you have to you have to give people credit. They're smarter than that. <laughs> and this is the beauty of um, doing many of one thing on a piece of paper. With there is power in numbers, because with like people are going to look at this and know it's flowers, and then they're most likely not going to notice this one wonky petal over here, or this one really thick petal, or you know all of that. So that's why. Um, like if I were to just do one aster in the center of a painting, then I would probably want to be a little bit more um, intentional. intentional. Um, but when I'm doing like a bunch on a piece of paper, I, I throw that expectation out because I know that the one is not going to um, mess it up, if that makes sense. Now that we've added petals and we're getting close to the end of adding all of the petals to our flowers, I want you to look at this from a compositional standpoint. What areas feel very bare? Where is your eye going to? Do we want the eye to go there? So for me, my eye is going right here, right? There's a bunch right here in the middle. And so that's not bad, but I kind of want to lead my viewer's eye up so I think what I'm going to do is I'm, after I add these petals, I'm gonna add a flower here, almost like I'm making a connection, like a snake, an S through here. So then it makes my viewer's eye go, oh, 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 oh. You know what I'm saying? Instead of just like, Rrr. But let me finish these petals up first and then we'll see what to do along the top. And it's funny because when you put in your yellow centers, that very first step, you can't really tell what the composition is going to do. You can like try and lay it out, but you don't really know until you start adding all of the different elements. And then you're like, ooh, I need to do this. I need to add this. Because your painting is going to change and it's going to inform you as you go. I know it's impossible to generalize everything, Sarah, but when you're painting, do you have a viewer in your mind or are you just like doing what feels good? Uh, can you, I'm not sure what you're asking. Like sometimes when you're talking about like the density or the composition of flowers, you're saying you want the viewer's eye to do this, to do this. When you're painting, when you're making something new, mm -hmm. are you aware, are you, do you have a viewer in mind? Are you just like- Oh, like Kathy? Or, uh, yeah, are you just thinking like, okay, I want someone's eye to do this? Or are you just painting and then later uh, adjusting composition? Do you Are you aware of the composition while you're doing it? Yes. Um, Kathy's a photographer, by the way. Is that, what, is that who you were saying? Kathy? Oh, <laughs> we know a lot of Kathy's actually. I just didn't know if you meant like someone specific, but you're basically asking, do I always keep composition in mind as I'm painting. Yeah, do you keep the viewer? Uh, I, well, how do I say this? Yes and no. Because that can be a slippery slope. By the viewer, I don't mean I'm painting this for someone to consume, so I need to paint something that they'll like. That is a slippery slope. I paint for me. I paint something that I really enjoy painting, especially in my personal work. I don't think about if Jane Doe is gonna look at this and like it. I'm just painting what interests me. But from a composition standpoint, I think about what the, the viewer's eye, where they're gonna go and what they're going to do to make sure that the composition doesn't distract from my painting. Not because I'm trying to make sure that they'll love it, but more like if your composition is um, really heavy or un, like feels unbalanced, then that can actually distract a viewer's eye from being able to actually see your painting. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's what I mean. For me, 
I am so distracted by this heavy center that I actually can't really even acknowledge everything else in this painting. That's a problem because I want my viewer's eye to feel like they can stay in here a minute and be interested in going all around. I mean, basically as an artist, you want the person looking at it to stay interested in your painting visually. And so we have to do compositional tricks to make it so then they'll actually want to stay and look instead of say, oh cool, and move on. Gotcha. Okay, so now that I added that, I'm going to adjust my composition. I'm going to add a yellow here, and I think I'm gonna add a yellow here. And let's see what that does. Maybe I'll do one here, because I still want it to feel like the flowers go off the page, that it doesn't like, I don't want clean edges around. And maybe here. And then I feel like it needs something here. Maybe here. Okay, let's see what that does. I took a photography class in college and on our section of composition, tell me if you agree with this. Okay. Our teacher told us that the best compositions are out of the way. I need more information. If a if something is composed well, if it's weighted correctly across the page, it's not too heavy in one spot, too light in one spot, you don't notice it. Mm -hmm, like the, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. piece can come through. Yes. It's out of the way. Yes. I think that's what I'm trying to say when I say composition can distract yeah. from your painting. That's what I mean. If your composition feels heavy on one side or something, that is what the viewer will notice. And they might not even have the language or the understanding to know what that's what they're noticing, but that's how it's gonna make them feel. Have you ever seen a painting where like the edge of it is right next to the edge of the paper and there's nothing else anywhere else? And it's so close to that edge that when you look at it, you just kind of go. Yeah. <laughs> and you just start leaning that way, that's when composition throws you off. You can't even notice the pretty flowers or the vase. All you're noticing is that it feels like it's gonna fall off. And so I would totally agree with your photography teacher. The, how did he say it? The best compositions are out of the way. The best compositions are out of the way. I would agree with that. But there is another thing, and this applies to pretty much every kind of art I've ever seen, is that you learn the rules to break, to the break them later because yes. there are some very successful pieces that are on purpose, yes. positionally, quote unquote, bad. If you're trying to, okay, just really quick, I think I'm going to do, well, let me add these petals before I add anything more. But that feels a little, see how that connects it? Yeah. And it feels like I can move through it instead of just stopping right in the middle. Yes. Um, absolutely. That is where you think about what feeling do I want this viewer to experience? And if you're trying to make them feel uncomfortable, you can use the rules of composition and break those rules to do so. I mean, um, gosh, it was so fun, like, in art class, because sometimes I would, I would purposely paint things in a way that were very active and um, uncomfortable. And the the way that people, like a figure drawing class, how they were standing was like distorted because I wanted to draw them out of that. I didn't want it to feel peaceful. I wanted people to look at what I was painting and feel uncomfortable. And so that's when all of these rules, you can take them and utilize them for whatever you're trying to communicate. Okay, this actually feels pretty good. I might add, maybe not a yellow center, maybe it's just the tips of petals coming out here. Yep, and maybe the same thing here. Okay, that feels better. And then we might have to go back and even add and adjust more as we continue on. Okay, so step three, we're gonna go towards the, um, go to the center of our flowers. So I'm gonna grab some tiger orange. As you can see, my tiger orange kind of bled into my magenta a little bit. So I'm gonna get some fresh tiger orange here. I'm gonna take some of that. I'm gonna mix it a little bit with that orange. And then what I'm going to do is basically around these edges, I'm gonna put in this orange, and then I'm gonna rinse my brush and swoop it 
but leaving a yellow center or like it could be perfectly in the center or kind of off center. Just leave a section of this yellow center yellow and paint around it if that makes sense. So this is just a, like another, it's like a light medium value that we're adding here. But you see how already just adding that center makes this flower pop a little bit more. Just by doing a little bit of a medium value, it's starting to make this flower come to life. And depending on how light your paint is, you might need water to kind of smear out that color, or you can use just the color on your brush. I do both. And another reason why this painting I think is really successful is we're playing with complementary colors here. Uh, complementary colors are colors that are across from each other on the color wheel. Purple and yellow is a set. And when you put these colors next to each other, they activate each other. And so this painting is essentially just total complementary colors, which means those yellow centers and those petal leaves are making your eyes bounce back and forth, and they're actually accentuating the colors as well. It's making them pop too. So I think that's another reason why I love this painting. If you were to do, like let's say you were to do white daisies instead of aster and do these white petals, it would be beautiful. It would feel way more um, peaceful just from the colors alone. I think learning about art in general, getting an education about art is so important. I, that same photography teacher, when I first went into that class, I was just such a newbie. And my idea of good photography was very different about than what my idea of good photography is now. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing my professor's work and he, he had a master's or a PhD, I don't remember, but he was very educated in photography. And I remember seeing it and going, ew. Oh, really? Yeah, like, this is not even good. How mm -hmm, is this guy mm -hmm, teaching? But, like, mm -hmm. listening to him and throughout the course of the course, I just realized, like, I was a fool for thinking that. This is gorgeous. It's not, it's not, I don't want people to be down on themselves for that. It's more like your understanding of art changes to where your definition of good changes. And it's actually really freeing because I feel like when you don't take the time to paint, even now, I'm sure people who are would consider themselves beginners and just learning, when you take the time to learn how to paint, the world opens up for you and you see things in a way that you've never seen before. And so then your understandings and ideas at the beginning are limited, not because of your lack of, it's just like not fully understanding. When you don't think about something, you can't grow. But then when you take the time to think about color value and you observe things like the light and the color and shape of a petal or things like that, um, it's like your mind opens up and there's a lot more opportunity, there's a lot more understanding, and there's a lot more acceptance. And I think that's why when you have when you're first starting out or don't have really a lot of experience with art, your mind is narrow of what could be good or bad. And then the more that you're exposed to information, the more your mind can grow. And you can say, oh, I had such a limited view before, but now I can see the value in creating a foot photograph that has this color balance or this subject matter, that kind of thing. His style is what you were talking about. His purpose in photography was to make you feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so when mm -hmm. I first saw it, I was uncomfortable and just thought, this is bad. Mm -hmm. But like when you realize that they're doing it on purpose, yeah, you're like, oh, this is 
this bad is good. <laughs> and then you go, you did it. Holy cow. You man. really did it. Yeah. And that still doesn't mean you have to like it, but you can respect it. You oh, can yeah. say, I still don't like it, but I respect it as an art form. Okay, so we added a medium value to our centers. As you can see, they already started to pop and bring to life. We're gonna do our fourth step, which basically I'm gonna go in and add different values to my petals and then also take the time to add a darker value where the petal meets the center because if something is coming out of the center and if you look at a flower, depending on its shape, if it kind of like angles in a little bit where the petal comes out from the center, there's gonna be a slightly darker value because it's coming out from something. So usually there's like a shadow and it might be on a slightly different plane where if you think about like cone flowers where the, the top of the center is like big and then the flowers kind of like go out from there, your center of your flower is gonna be lighter value and then it's gonna kind of go away from that or the opposite. Does that make sense? So think about if you're viewing this flower, if it slightly goes in in the center, and if it's coming out of the center, there's gonna be a slightly different value. And just those little details of slightly darkening values and things like that, those small things are what brings our flowers to life. So I have that same kind of purple-blue mixture. I'm not gonna add as much water on there. And you can just go and then right at where it's coming out. So you see how that one already feels just way more dimensional? Absolutely. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And then just for like to, so it doesn't feel, what I don't want it to feel is I don't want it to feel like tie dye. I don't want just this dark ring around all of them. So sometimes I'll go in and just add like a darker petal here or there just to connect the center to the edge. So kind of play with different values. And sometimes I'll just add a little bit of water to some to lighten them up as two. Basically what we're going for is just different values. And I feel like even though I said to do a darker petal, this one feels too dark. So I'm just gonna slightly lift up some of that color. Okay, that feels better. And I'm just gonna repeat that on all of them. So it's not fully fleshing each one out. It's kind of just adding different values here and there. And you guys can decide where to put them if you ever want to lighten or darken some. And if you want to kind of like shape your center too by just kind of like blending that color around it, you can do that. And I'm going to start on the left-hand side and work my way across so I don't get my hand wet. I have a tendency to, <laughs> to like paint the right side first and then my hand's always in my paint. So here I put in my center and then to just soften it, you can just like kind of make that color spread out a bit. Pull it out just a little bit. And let's add a couple more petals too. You know the like um, burn sage kind of thing, burn sage in a room to clear things out, that mm -hmm. kind of like spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, when I was reading about asters, uh, people would do that to the aster plant as well. Oh, really? Yeah. And again, we're in that kind of meditative, repetitive brushstroke. And also on some of these, like maybe even these smaller ones, like if you, how do I say this? Like maybe even this area where it's very congested, right? We, I got a lot. I might not do like this one, that like dark center on it. Let's just see. I, I'm saying that in the way of like, sometimes by 
not having it on all of them, it creates even more visual variation and places for your eyes to rest and can give a different sense of depth and dimension. So let's do... Center on this. I'm just gonna kind of blend it out just to soften it. Maybe you can do a couple darker petals. And then I'm gonna kind of round out that center. And I've looked at a bunch of different pictures of Aster and sometimes the petals are like spread out and then sometimes they're really like overlapping. So that's why I kind of have both. So if there's like this one, these petals feel very spread out. This one, they're very much overlapping and I'm gonna leave both of them. Both of them have room here. They're welcome. You can even do a couple like detail lines if you want. Just thin little Isn't it interesting, you can, like the ones where you added that darker value, it just like, they, they're popping off the page a little bit more. Yeah, they're like the only ones I see. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, I mean, I got a little bit of yellow in some of these petals where my, or purple in some of, some of my center where there's been, maybe if it was wet, there was a little bit of bleeding, that's okay. I actually really like that. I like that look. Sometimes I'll do a bunch of the like centers at once and then go back and then just blend them all out, kind of like batching. So like this one, so these three I added a darker value. This one I didn't, and I think I actually might just leave it. I, I kind of like, I feel like it just gives it a different feel, and I like that. Um, but if I were to like keep going and let's say that when I step back, that was the only thing my eye went to, then maybe I would add something to kind of... Um, like tone that down. But for me, it doesn't distract. It makes it feel like they're on different planes. Yeah, like maybe one is behind the other and these other ones are on top, that kind of thing. It looks like a fancy pitcher of water at a house party. You know, they like float flowers. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I can get behind that.
And please know that if you're just struggling, I mean, I will say that the for me, um, I really like dagger brushes for leaves. Sometimes they're a little bit tricky with petals. I thought they lend, lend, lend themselves. Lent themselves um, to this project. But if you're really struggling and you just keep getting like sharp edges that you don't like, go to your round. Use your round two. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, I'm, I can feel myself getting close to being done with this step. I think this one needs it. So this is kind of where you're kind of looking at your composition as a whole. And if there's some flowers that you, your eye keeps going to, maybe those are the ones that you need to address. Or if there's some that completely fall off the um, page. Let's actually do this one. I'm gonna leave that one alone, but I'm gonna do the one next to it. Okay. That, feel, that feels pretty good. All right, now we're gonna move on to our very last step, which is we are going to add a darker value to the center of our flower. So I'm gonna take a little bit more magenta, and I'm actually, so it's like magenta yellow, so it's just like this very red orange. And let's grab a little bit, tiny bit of purple, and add that, because that's gonna make it brown. And using this kind of warm brown color, you can kind of shape the centers and do little dots in the middle. And if you want, I mean like, if I remember correctly, the centers had little yellow kind of bumps in the center, is that right? Those are all the individual flowers. Yes, and then some of them even had like a really, like a darker center, like a sunflower. It's probably if they've been pollinated or not. Really? Yeah, there's these pretty little flowers by our house called field roses. Mm -hmm. And they only stay vibrant like that in the center until they've been pollinated. And then immediately the plant turns off spending energy on looking pretty. Interesting. Yeah. Once you've been pollinated, game over. <laughs> They're like, my job is done. So then you can add, and you guys can decide. You're, because we're mixing colors, maybe you want to do like the actual individual dots with more yellow and then just use this brown for the edge. Because what we don't want is we don't want there to be like polka dots across the center of our flower. See how disjointed that feels compared to maybe this one? So if your brown is just too dark, just use that as like the edge of the center shadow. And then you can use just yellow or maybe like an orange for a few little detail lines in the center. So I just want to call attention to that one that I was showing. I blended all of that color out, which made it an even brown. And you can see it feels much flatter in dimension compared to like the ones next to it because that center is just an even value. So I'm just gonna put a little drop of water on there to lighten it up and then I can go back in and add a shadow. So I'm just kind of going through adding that very last value that's really gonna make our flowers pop.
And now I kind of like step back and say, okay, are there any centers that are falling a little bit flat? This one feels flat. It's basically the ones that I missed. Or maybe I didn't go as dark as I need to, or I went too dark. And again, if you go too dark, all is not lost. Just put some clean water on there, let it sit for a second, and then lift. Feels pretty good. I think I got them all. Okay, that's our project. Beautiful. We did it. Um, I hope you have fun with this, and um, I hope you can see that just by adding just a couple layers of value um, is really all you need to get your flowers to pop. So if you're trying to do flowers on your own and you're really struggling with them, and if you're saying to yourself, these just look flat, they just look flat, I challenge you to look at your values. Because if you can get at least a light, a medium, and a dark value in there, you're gonna get some dimension. Um, if you're on Instagram, I would love to see your work. You can tag us at Let's Go Make Art or hashtag Let's Make Art. If you're on Facebook group, if you're on Facebook, you can join our Facebook group. That's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. Very large, very kind community. Um, don't be intimidated. There is a range of um, skill level there. And I've noticed that usually people who are more experienced are more confident in posting their work, which unfortunately perpetuates the idea that you shouldn't share your work unless you're really, really good. And that's just not true. Everybody starts somewhere. So be brave, share what you're painting no matter where you're at, we wanna see it. And uh, if you need any of these supplies, or if you're interested in the book that I illustrated, The Language of Flowers, you can find that at letsmakeart.com. All right. Thanks, you guys. Bye.